my guest today is is quite the interesting character. He reached out to me through our contact form and uh, wanted to discuss a, a number of various topics. He's a he's a musician who's also into uh, certain different paranormal activities and things. He even mentioned something about a, a Sasquatch sighting in behind his house that we might touch on. I don't know. Just uh, stick around and find out today on the Unframe of Mind Show. You're listening to the Unframe of Mind Show, the place to have the most mind-stretching, unprotected intellectual intercourse of your life. Your host, Daniel Wagner, battles the forces of evil by loving fiery balls of truth, reason, and, and evidence over savory rules. All righty. Well, mm-mm-mm. let me make sure we're in the right place at the right time, because that would be terrible if we weren't. Yeah, that would be bad. <laughs> at any rate, um, so... Today's guest is is, is is I'm telling you, man, what is with you in recordings? I don't know. I, I don't know. It, you it, absolutely uh, suck at this. <laughs> we do live shows. You are phenomenal. Now I'm getting berated. It's like you need some kind of pressure for for doing just the recording shows. I know, I know, I know. Anyway, so today's guest is named Ed Roman. Ed Roman is an award-winning singer, songwriter, performer, and multi-instrumentalist from Shelbourne, Ontario in Canada. Ed's musical stylings blur the lines between pop, rock, and folk and country music genres. His uniquely crafted songs have received regular rotation on more than 100 terrestrial radio stations across North America and more than 400 stations worldwide. If all that wasn't enough, the reason I was interested in inviting this gentleman to the show is because by all indications, and as far as I can tell, he's a goofball. He's a man after my own heart. So, with all that said, I'd like to welcome you to the show, Ed. Ed, welcome. (laughs) How are you, Anthony? Tony, it's a pleasure to be here. Good deal. All right, so let's 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 jump in. I, I've got a, I've got a um a topic that I wanted your specific uh, uh opinion on because of your involvement in the music industry and that kind of thing. Um, I, I got to, I got to thinking the other day. Let me let me see if if this rings true to you. Is is I was sitting there thinking about the nature of the music industry and how vanity as a as an idea has kind of taken it over and and given us this this scenario where now we have this music industry that's like so much tied to vanity that it kind of strips away and, and you know any chance of probably some of the best music we've ever heard uh, and the reason I say this is because I noticed back during arguably one of the best musical you know eras of all time um, you had some really phenomenal musicians and and but you never saw them they weren't on TV they weren't they didn't have to look a certain way and they didn't have to have a certain aesthetic about them and it seems to me and and again I'll, I'll let you hop in here in just a second it seems to me that it has slowly degraded over time the more we focus on the on the looks of the and the, and the aesthetics of it, and less so on the music of it. Is that something that you've seen? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I grew up in an era, I mean, you're wearing a Floyd shirt. And I, when I saw your shirt, I was like, okay, cool. Like, <laughs> you know, we're kind of on the same page as far as like headspace and, and, and prowess and music you, you were talking. From that era, it bred so many amazing artists, musicians for... It seemed like so long, but really in the grand scheme of the cosmos, a blink of an eye. And it, you're right, in a very short period of time, this triumph of the ego, you know, and this sort of ego-driven kind of thing it has sort of taken over. The industry has changed so much. And so often I, I have these kinds of conversations with musicians, family, friends, people that ask me those kinds of questions. And I think, well... You know, it's funny. When I used to listen to Steely Dan, I don't remember them selling Aftershave. <laughs> uh, when I was listening they didn't to Rush, do that. I don't remember <laughs> Getty Lee selling shoes. You know, uh, the, it, Jimmy Page was not out selling shampoo. And so often these artists today are more like, and if you look even statistically, and I could you know send you guys some stats on like streaming, Major artists that we would consider in the commercial sense of major artists today, Beyonce, Taylor Swift, people like this, uh, they're in the revenue of like 9K for streaming. And most of the residuals for what they're doing, a lot of the time, I think, are coming from corporate kickback. Like, you know, my wife, she's got like some cosmetics magazine. You open it up, there's Taylor Swift and she's selling you know, shoes, and then there's perfume, and then there's all this other stuff that's attached contractually um, in their arrangements that they have as spokespeople 
for a lot of oh, those yeah. kinds of oh, products. Yeah. And I think music of yesteryear, a lot of writers and people, you know, music is like, you know, the definition of an artist, Herbie Hancock once said, is one who has the ability to fuse their life with the rhythm of the times. And art in, in general is that sort of like reflective yelp of who we are in this moment. It's an epitaph kind of thing is you want to look at it at a dark point, but look back through history at librettos from famous operas. Uh, even Chuck Berry himself in his description of C'est la vie mm -hmm. uh, is about the American condition and where people were at that moment in time. And today it's not so much about that. It's a lot about the self, like you said, and that sort of exacerbated form of the ego that is not real. My okay. heroes were poor people that were like walk to walk and talk to talk. Heck, I'm not. Even, I'm not even so much against the ego-driven portion of it I'm as as much as I am about the van, the vain, the vanity portion of it. I mean, because I mean, you kind of have to be in touch with yourself to to be able to pull. You know, some of that, some of that stuff, you got to be able to pull real, real deep, and you got to be really in touch with yourself. And you kind of, kind of, the ego kind of has to be there as part, right. like an integral part of it. It's it's uh, just when when I'm sitting there trying to focus on. You know, my musicians, I, I don't really care what they look like, but a lot of people nowadays do. And it really matters. And like I, I, I remember having a conversation with a guy um, where he was telling me about some musician or no, I was telling him. I'm sorry. I was telling him about a musician and it was a female vocalist. And his first question to me was, can you guess what his first question to me was? Just out of curiosity. <laughs> uh, let me think. Uh What's the first tune? There's, there's no, there's no wrong answer here, but, but basically, <laughs> well, probably not. Probably but basically, not. basically, he, he looks at me and says, "Well, is she hot?" I'm like, "Oh, really? <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I've, I've never seen her. All I've, all I've, all I've done is heard her music, and it's, it's fantastic. And it's like, right. it doesn't matter what she looks like if the music's fantastic, does it? And it's sex sells, though. You know that. Oh, I mean, that's I just always oh, been yeah, part of, of it. And, and I guess ego's the wrong thing because prowess comes through, through, through ego and wielding that in, in a really you know positive vibrative way is is the is whole thing but you're right i agree with you more in that sentiment about that other part of it because um it, it's it's very reflective in a, in a lot of the, the lyrical content and especially in the, in the main state commercial but you know I, I i just try to focus on writing and mm -hmm. and uh and and not always paying so much attention to the to the machine because i think it can be sort of saturated you know, and, and detrimental to the creative process, although you cannot help but get feedings of it. You know, now, are there, are there specific artists today that you admire or that you enjoy listening to that kind of brings you back to the way music used to be? Esperanza Spalding, for me, has really been turning me over my head as far as composition, dexterity, development, um, I mean, even just the, the breadth of the distance between where she goes on some of her albums is, is just sort of has that feeling that, that you know, other people, put, when they push those envelopes, it was OK. That's another reason why we kept listening to them. Mm. Uh, the Beatles have that sort of infinite growth inside of their development to the point where like i mean you know john lennon could have farted in a microphone and it would have been like gold right it <laughs> would have sold millions so, yeah yeah but you know um but yeah yeah again I, she's she's a huge influence i mean um derek trucks the tedeschi project like i mean i think derek and his slide playing and i've been following everything that's been going on with him for years uh it's so spiritual. It's really connective. It's funky. It's jazzy. It's just got all that compartmentalized, earthy grunge I like. And, and it's human. It's a little rough. It's rough around the edges. It's not quantized. Yeah, yeah. That is, so there, there was a, a podcast I was listening to. Um, it's uh, by Malcolm, Malcolm Gladwell. He's been doing a, a podcast called The uh, Broken Record. And he goes and he, he interviews different musicians and things like that. And I actually got introduced to uh, Roseanne Cash through this method and i was like i was like man because i've been listening my wife loves listening to country music or so-called country music <laughs> she's got the country music <laughs> you know tuned in i'm like i like i don't 
I, like, I don't mind country music, but this is not country music. This is like some kind of weird country pop kind of very commercialized fake. It seems real shallow. The lyrics, there's no depth to them at all. It's whatever all. sells records. I know, it's, it's I know. Not, it doesn't have so, a significance or the meaning behind it like it once did. So so I've I've kind of since written off country as a as a potential, you know, resource for good music. And, and I hate to, to have done that, but then, then I heard, I heard that podcast and I heard Roseanne Cash and she played a few songs on there and I'm like, Oh my God, there's still people out there writing yeah. great music. I mean, I knew yeah. this, I knew this inherently, but it's like, it, it just smacks you in the face sometimes. Like you just, you don't expect it. You're like, wow, this is, this is really deep stuff. This is great, great music right here. And I love it. And I, I went and immediately downloaded her album. You know, that's, there's, there's little gems like that out there, but it's like, I just hate to write off an entire genre of music because of what the commercialization of it all has done to it. It's ridiculous. Well, yeah. And it works invertedly. I mean, I've been turned on to artists I had n- no knowledge of because I was watching a car commercial. Yeah, I've done, I've done, I've done that. I've done that. I, I think that, that, that might be a different kind of commercialization, but yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, but for working on it from that perspective, I work with licensing deals and publishing things that I'm doing for commercial stuff, and it's given me a lot of headway with what I do because yeah, it might be used for a 15 second spot as a stinger, but it's going to maybe ask that same question. You know, who was that to somebody else, and then they're listening to what I've done, and boom. It's inverted. You know, yeah, oh, yeah. It's, it's a great marketing strategy. It's it's not so much, you know, being on commercials I have a problem with. It's just it's just when all the music, it becomes so commercialized and sounds, the, the music genre itself starts to sound like a like a parody of itself. It's like, oh, come on, guys. Or, or when there's that <laughs> subtle paradox that exists inside of like, okay, it's like a bank commercial and I'm listening to the lyrics for like a Rolling Stone. You know, Dylan, like I just or, you know, uh, recently Canada issued a stamp, you know, with the, the Rush logo, you know, with the guy standing in the sort of in the star shape. Right. Which is sort of the 2112 overture symbol from that record, which is like the man against the machine. And here it's now being issued as a governmental stamp. You know, it's just like, what? <laughs> like, hashtag irony. Yeah. No yeah, 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 no yeah, kidding. yeah. Yeah, I was, I was just curious. I was just curious if I, to get your input and your, your take on that particular subject. I figured I knew this was something you'd be real passionate about um, just based on looking at your website and, and getting to know you through your what marketing materials you put out of course but um I, I was listening to a few of your songs and we might we might bring one up and play it if you're okay with that later on yeah, man, before the sure. before the end of the show totally. um kind of a catchy little tune and I, I realized as i was working on typing the intro and stuff i'm sitting here singing it in my head i'm like oh shit he done got me <laughs> <laughs> thanks guys i appreciate that <laughs> yeah no problem no problem it's, it's like a good smack yeah you know. well yeah yeah a good smack yeah, yeah yeah the one that makes you go oh <laughs> That almost sounds kind of dirty, man. I, it was supposed to. <laughs> that was the point. <laughs> it's not like the one like, well, how about breakfast? No. You know, it's- <laughs> no not that one. <laughs> not that one. Now you just need to be submissive. <laughs> All right, so 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 let's let's move into something a little more a little more in line with what our standard show is about. Um as much as I love talking about music. I actually did used to have a podcast called called the uh Shit, I can't forget what it's called. Stars under yeah. Stars Underground. I used to have a podcast where we I talked to musicians and helped them with their marketing strategies and things like that. So it was, it was, a, lot, it was a lot of fun. I, I really enjoy this shit. At any rate, so um, you it was it was your 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 manager, I guess, was the one I was actually communicating with, which was strange for me. I've never I've never really done that for this type of topic, but it was cool. Um, we were going back and forth, and he mentioned something about like the the, the how the paranormal has been a, a huge influence over your life throughout throughout the course of it, and it gave me a little piece a little piece to read. And as I'm reading it, I'm like, I'm not really sure what to think about this. And I was hoping maybe you could convince me, you know, because I, I don't, I'm a, I'm a skeptic when it comes to this kind of thing. I don't, I don't really believe in the paranormal, ghosts, spirits, all that stuff. And and maybe, maybe you could have bring forward something that would convince me. Or I, I mean, I don't want to put all that pressure on you, but I just wanted to hear about your experiences and what that, what this means to you. Maybe, um, maybe if you could uh, detail a little bit about the influence it's had on your life, you know, that kind of thing. Well, man, I, again, I th- I'm, I'm still a skeptic in so many ways of, of things, and I still question the stuff that has occurred to me, stories I've heard. I've been filtered a lot of stories that mm-hmm. I, you know, just know <laughs> I just laugh and or 
some research that I've done has led me to think mm, there's a probability, but still not sure. You know, all of those things I think are healthy in any kind of investigation. Um, I guess for myself, it, having family allegory as part of like that you know, your grandmother's telling a story and, you know, you're getting confirmation about what happened from your parents and did this really happen, you know. So my grandmother's brother was born with all of his hair in his teeth mm -hmm. and at the age of uh, eight months could already speak fluently. And from that point on, about the year of age one, would pr predicted that he would die at the age of 11 and started practicing his funeral. In this really morbid old, I know, yeah, I know you're looking at each other going, what the fuck? This is like right, old, yeah. country, old country stuff. There's the forest is dark and we make soup, right? Okay. So uh, it happened. The kid died exactly like he said, practiced his funeral one day. My grandmother bought him this stuff, great grandmother. Um, he put it on, laid under this tree. Kids came like they were doing it for years and the kid died. Um, and it was taken as something as the kid was a, you know, gifted child or he, because there was, it's like, there's no stories attached to like, you know, he levitated cows in the village or anything like that. It's just was this phenomenal, uh, you know, kind of story. And then I guess it kind of awakened me to the probability that, okay, this may be something that is real because my grandmother's brother. And it's not just somebody they heard a story about. Um, and then that was also fueled by a family incident that happened um, in the late 1960s, before I was born, with my family, um, where my mom had been making dinner in late November, and the v windows started vibrating in our house, and my mom thought something was wrong with our furnace or something in the basement, so when she ran downstairs, there was nothing running. She came upstairs, big bay window in our kitchen, and the family story is they saw an oblong-shaped ball floating between the barn and our house that had a glowing array of vortex of lights now in description, still talking about it with my family. It hovered there for about five minutes. It was so bright, you couldn't look at it like an arc light, like a welding light. It cast no shadows, even though it was so bright to look at. When you looked away, there'd be no shadow from a tree or shadow from a light pole or something to that regard. And then it took off, it like floated up. My mom says, she still describes it today, went over top of our barn and bounced like a ball following the topography of the landscape for heading to the southeast. My dad came home from a council meeting because he was a public servant. He didn't believe her. The next day, she got the local newspapers, and it was reported by the David Dunlop Observatory and the Buttonville Airport, which was a little airport where we lived, near where we lived, that they had tracked six unidentified flying objects in the area. Uh, that night and again that story was something that made me question and look and wonder and uh, you know that's the thing like it's one thing to read it about it in a book or a novel or see it in a tv show but when it's it's first-hand account from seven other people that goes on and on it becomes part of your christmas stories that you tell every year hey remember when you know it it, it seemed to be ongoing um, and, and, and I guess that's what really, for me, got me thinking about the paranormal and, and the possibilities of what that meant. But my own experiences later in life are what more defined my feeling of this is impossible in terms of coincidence and circumstances that lead me to believe that I'm either having somebody communicate from the other side post-death or uh, it's not me and through so many different circumstances, anthropomorphizing some circumstance, looking for that sense of solace uh, in my own abbreviated version of, are you okay? Yes, here's the message, right? <laughs> and, um, so I, I go, okay, so what does all this mean? And then I, I, I weigh it against other things too, like for instance, the coincidence factor. When there are like multiple forms of coincidence that exist inside of it 
like a police officer, well, they go, well, if there's two circumstances that are coincidental, they consider that a lead and they follow that. Mm-hmm. And, when, and, and again, statistically, there are unbelievable statistical things that can happen. I've seen a guy that was like, you know, uh, I think it was a parachuting incident or something that happened. And he may have been it may, it may have been a near miss of a piece of asteroid rock or something. I'm mean, not sure if it's confirmed or not yet, but circumstantially, that the probability of something like that happening is in the trillions to one. So you know, again, weigh it with the grain of salt to to determine what is going on here, and then multiple people being involved in those experiences to witness it. For confirmation, it's one thing to say this happened to me in a singular fashion. This is the event, and then you don't have anything to back it up. You don't have photography. You don't have a body. You don't have whatever it is to bring that sense of important scientific validity to any investigation. So, for me, you know, again, it's it's it becomes part of that. So, literally, you've got like stories from multiple accounts, but nothing other than just word of mouth at this point to to back anything up. Is that what that was? Well, yeah. Like, I mean, if I had. uh, okay, so, for instance, I was writing some things down here before the show and and, um, a good friend of mine passed away a number of years ago. We were very tight. Musicians played together for years, grew up together, hide and seek, chase girls, the whole thing, you know, Um and when he died, it was it was tragic because it was an irony thing. Food and beverage manager for 13 years and dies of a food allergy thing because of a mix up of a plate of food where he was working. Wow. Oh. It leaves a four and a half month old baby boy and a beautiful wife. Wow. Sorry, to hear, um, sorry to hear that, man. Yeah. So, no, I, I know, man. And bless you for saying that. But it, the, I have solace in the experiences that I had because of that. And oh, so here we are. It's the wake, you know. There's 150 people. Everything calms down. There's a tight knit group of 40 of us guys, girls that we all grew up together. Go to this place, some drinks, sitting around talking. I go out to the street about 11:30, standing there having a smoke, mm-hmm. and these three kids are walking by, and I hear them talking. It's getting louder, and as they're getting closer, they're saying, "Okay, so how do we break into this junkyard?" Uh, we, if we we could steal the door from the from a car that's like that, and we'll put it on, and da 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 da, and I'm and I'm just sort of in this mode of like we were up there storytelling, you know, reminiscing, and and these kids are just arbitrarily walking down the street, and I said I have to stop you, and they thought I was a cop, and I said I'm not a cop, I said I was listening to your story, and I I'm staggered because what you're saying right now actually happened to me. And another friend of mine that just passed away and another buddy of mine, we did this. We broke into a junkyard. We stole a Pinto door, <laughs> drove it on our bikes home <laughs> three miles down the road in the middle of the night. We attached it to his parents' car, Pinto, and they weren't even the wiser after it had happened. We were bad boys. Like a little bit and of I a said, deja vu, I guess. I, 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 <laughs> yeah, we're, right. having, we're having this wake, and I, I, I can't believe that I'm hearing this. I can't believe that I'm hearing this story. Can you please come in to, I want you to meet my friends and to bring some of the validity to this. Cause they're not going to believe me if I walk in there and tell them this happened. So they come in with me. Mm-hmm. We walk up the stairs, take my jacket off. It's winter time. It's cold. And they're sort of chit chatting. And I'm like, Hey everybody, I got to tell you. And so I explain it and it, nobody says anything. And I said, what's wrong? You guys don't believe me. And they just said, Ed, we were just telling that story. So literally, while I left the room, they're describing this story, uh, and I'm not aware of it. I'm out on the street arbitrarily, and these three kids that have nothing to do with me, the circumstances, the experience, or anything like that, are going to do this exact thing, <laughs> practically at the same age yeah. that we were. And here... I, you know, go in and I'm staggered by the moment. The probabilities of something like that, that three kids, like us three kids, did that, happened to be walking down the street, talking about it openly, like, and I would arbitrarily hear it, to be the only one to understand completely what has been going on. Bring them inside, not knowing that they're actually talking about that story. And then all of a sudden there's this huge, and everybody starts to laugh and cry. Because they know it has this, like, it's Bane. It's our buddy. 
you know, he's 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 kind of proverbially knocking on the door in that the weirdest of ways, esoteric as it may be. But again, on, on a statistical level, the probability of that are, are in the trillions. So yeah, I, 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 again, I again weigh it with, <laughs> with that healthy sense, sense of skepticism and go, well, OK, well, it's possible that it becomes a complete fluke. But that's just so odd to me that it would happen at that moment in my existence. How, 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 like it's, it's, it's in, in the weirdest of ways. I didn't go, you know, searching online, looking for kids that were trying to steal car doors. It just, these, these kids were walking down the street. Or oh, uh, Sarah, maybe somebody, you know, hired three kids to walk by to say that. <laughs> it's that whole CIA thing. I'm telling you. <laughs> That's good. That well, might I, be I it. For a, for a bunch of bumpkin farm kids, but we must have been being watched pretty carefully. Right. Yeah. Right? So I know that's a lot of information to take in. So I kind of want to reel this back a little bit to the beginning um, because I've got some questions myself. So when you were discussing the conversation or the story about the 11 year old um, born with teeth and a full head of hair, was there anything else about that story that would lead you to believe that there might've been something else going on as far as genetically or, you know, things of that nature. It, there's a movie and I cannot remember the name of it. And the whole time you've been talking, I've been trying to rack my brain what it's called, but it's the one where the kid is born. He's older, but then as he dies, he, he gets younger. It's a Benjamin Button. Oh, yes. Benjamin yes. Button. That, that's what it kind of, it's a Benjamin Button. Right. Yeah. It's what it kind of reminded me of. So I was, I was kind of curious as the kid was getting older, w- was he progressing in life or ha- what happened with that? Or was there really never anything discussed about it after the story was told? Oh, before you answer that, I just wanted to point out this, what just happened is um, I had already read that in the story that was sent to me. So I, I knew that story. And when you said it, for him, it was like we just ran over a speed bump or uh, ran over something in the road. And like you and I are just driving on like nothing's wrong. And he's like, I- I'm pretty sure. Should we go back? And what was that back there? <laughs> it was a log and a skidoo suit. <laughs> <laughs> something. So, so go, go, go ahead. I just I had to get that in there. No, no, I'm glad. I'm glad. And, and um, uh, what else was discussed? Uh, there was something about an older lady that was in the village that kept coming to my great grandmother, telling him that he was like special somehow. So he never really aged any more beyond. He, he aged normally had. as a child, okay. past that. But for him to be speaking so young, and I agree with you, genetically, these kinds of things are possible. There are all mm-hmm. kinds of genetic mutations that can occur. Mm-hmm. Um, but. It was that that there just seemed to be this immediate assimilation of life right. that then started to have this idea that it wouldn't last long, and I'm and I know exactly when I'm, I'm it's going to be terminated. Hmm. Yeah, that that, it, it makes it makes me um, it kind of calls to mind the idea of the seen versus the unseen because you know that that does seem like an amazing story, and and I don't want to try to try to uh, diminish that in any way. But I'm sitting there wondering how many um, how many grandmothers uh, basically told their kid that you're special and or, or something's going to happen to you at 11 who didn't who didn't die at 11. You know, you know what I'm saying? How, how many times did that happen where it just never really came to fruition? So we nobody remembers it as an odd occurrence. So, uh, it, you know, does that make sense? Absolutely. And, and I think that's it's that's all like good, healthy skepticism inside of it, I guess. For me, it was just like this. Okay, um, I, I, you know, I go to school and play road hockey with my friends, and here I'm hearing these stories that 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 sort of freaked me out as a kid, right? Because well, I didn't, I, I did not like you, the road bump. I what you know? So, um, but for me, I guess that's the thing. Uh, it, 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 I guess it excited the 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 possibility that that. Uh, the the unnormal, the things that are just so uh, radically different in the framework of things mm-hmm. that stands out um, to the point where you, you go, well, how could this child know that he was going to die exactly at this age? And would start like, you know, is it pre-manifest destiny? But from such a young mind, where does that sense of his conscience 
at the age of eight being able to articulate himself yeah, right come from <laughs> You know, that's the the unseen seen part that you're talking about that still I I question and go, I don't understand. I've seen um, a documentary on a child. This was back years ago now. And she, from the age that she was very young, could recollect all this stuff about another village that she was born in, the names of people, what the location looked like, uh, describe the relatives, some of them by name, and then even gave a telephone number that was only off by one digit. And when the family finally ended up calling the number, it was the displacement of the two digits at the end that were incorrect. So I don't know how a child could know all that information. Is it past life stuff? Is this something that's sort of smudge residual? Yeah, I've got you a, know, in the in the grander scheme of the dimensional aspect of who we are, I don't know. I've got an interesting story to tell both y'all because it, it just kind of reminded me of something I went through, and I thought it was always kind of eerie. Mm-hmm. So, back in two thousand and one, um, I'm not going to try to draw this out because it's kind of lengthy of a story. But long story short, I was going to spend Christmas with my family down in Georgia for the first time. This was back in 2001. So I had some car trouble. I convinced my cousin Kelly to come up here to get me to spend, you know, to bring me down to Georgia to spend Christmas with everybody. So at that time, you know, this was back before, you know, Facebook and all the social media outlets and all this and texting. And and I sent her an email and I said, Hey, I said, my car's in the shop. Can you come get me? Yada, yada, yada. So we went back and forth and, you know, she was telling me, no, I can't do it. I can't get the time off from work, this, that, and the other. So finally, after a couple of times of, of, of poking at her and trying to get her to do it, she, you know, she finally, I convinced her to come get me. So the, the night before, um, she was scheduled to come up here and get me, she was going to spend a few days in Nashville. So the night before I received an email at 8 37 PM and what was interesting was, and it's, it's kind of a sad twist, but um, she was involved in a car accident, which eventually would take her life. But the interesting thing was, is that the, the night before I received the email at 8.37 p.m., she died December 15th at 8.37 p.m. I kid you not, because I was like, that that is, it gave me chills because I was just like, I went back and looked at the email because it was the last thing that I heard from her Mm -hmm. and it wasn't a phone call. It was just an email telling me, Hey, I'm on my way. I got to swing by my dad's first. Let me get some stuff. And, and for the longest time I saved that email and I knew the time of death and, and I know it sounds kind of creepy, but I just did because of that email. So the email was received at 837 PM, her accident. She was pronounced dead at 837 PM the next day. And it's just like, I don't know if there's any kind of relevance, but you know, if there's any kind of I don't know what that meant. I don't know if it was very coincidental, but then I kind of thought, well, what are the odds? Right. What are the so, odds so of de- that detail that you notice? Yeah, like like the, like I, I do know that like our brains have a tendency to go through, and and we'll we'll notice little points of you know similarity. Yeah. In in a lot of different details, that that detail could have meant absolutely nothing, um, but it's just your mind sees it and goes, oh, I remember that. That's and and plus during that time in your life, you're like super heightened your your senses are heightened you're super aware of every little detail yeah. it's like very traumatic so you know that's very possible that you're going to remember you know heck you might have seen a skew number on a on a on a on a product as you walk through the store that just happened to say 837 at the end and mm-hmm. that would have been that would if you would have done that then you'd have been like Oh my God, that's three times I've seen the same number. But then again it could have just been a coincidence at the same time. Well I I don't I don't know I mean, I don't know what the odds would be of something like that happening. I I really don't. But I thought it was very eerie to know when I went back and looked at that last email from her. Because, you know, when you go through a traumatic event, you look and you reminisce of the things of the conversation. So I went back and looked at the email. and I just so happened to notice it says time received 837. When I talked to my family, they had taken her off life support and she died at 837. It was like I, I literally got chills and I'm like. I don't even know how to explain that. <laughs> I almost, like, I almost don't wonder. Almost, almost wonder if um, you know, you're you're in your mind kind of blaming yourself. I mean, if you want to see the full full story on that, we did record this. I think we called it Anthony Tells All or something like that back on our podcast feed. I don't think we actually went into that. Yeah, 
Did we? Yep. <laughs> oh, we did it's whole, been, did we've done so many shows <laughs> and so many, story. but that was, that was part of it that we never really discussed and no, I never no, thought not, about not until. The eight, not the 837 part. That, right, that wasn't right. covered. Yeah. But I, I almost wonder like if you're kind of in this moment of going, well, uh, you know, I feel like it was my fault anyway. Mm-hmm. Like I, if, if something could have been different, maybe you're also kind of looking for any little detail that would point out that or, or signify a reason why it happened to maybe so that you couldn't, you know, I'm, okay, it, it, was, it was destined to happen, 837 keeps showing up, maybe it was it was destined to happen, and I, I don't have to blame myself anymore. Maybe, you know, it could have been something like that. I don't I don't know, I'm just... I'm, no, I'm I, 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 yeah, I understand, but, you know, I haven't been back down to Georgia for Christmas since 2001 when the accident happened, so I'm actually going down to spend Christmas with everybody for the first time yeah. this coming up weekend, and because I remember that number... And it's weird. And like what you were just talking about, you just subconsciously start thinking of those numbers. And I have been up until, you know, a couple of days ago, I was like, that 837 would pop out. It would be from, you know, I could, you know, sitting on the couch and all of a sudden I happen to look over at my phone just to check to see what time it is. And it's 837. Oh. That <laughs> happened to me a few days ago. And I'm just like, well, that's kind of almost like when but you- I didn't think much of it. When I checked yeah. my phone, I was sitting on the couch and I was watching a Preds game and I just so happened to hit the power or the uh, the home button just to see what time it was because I work nights yeah. and I usually get ready for work at a certain time. And I just so happened to click on it and it said 837. And I was just kind of like, hmm. Kind of like, kind of like when okay. you buy a new vehicle, and then suddenly everybody in town is driving that vehicle, or the same color car. <laughs> yeah. you, you, you buy the, you buy the like the coolest color car, and you're thinking you're the only one out there that drives it. And then you get on the road, and you're like, well, shit, I see twenty of the same color cars. <laughs> right, right. You know, I just thought that was interesting and something I just kind of wanted to, you know, share with you because I know we're on this topic, but I just thought it was very interesting that that specific number i mean it, it's just it's always kind of messed with me over the years and i thought it was kind of you know something i would yeah, right kind of share right with on. everyone but yeah right. it's just you know, uh, i'm, I'm sorry yeah. for your loss i mean that's I appreciate it, it. It, and this is the thing about your statement i mean this heightened sense of awareness at these critical moments in our lives whether it be through somebody passing or victory some victorious moment um uh, I've heard people talking about them having visions after they've reached Everest summit, you know, and it's not just even being there and knowing that you've, you've, you've breached the top. It's, it's almost, and that maybe you're low on oxygen, but the experience almost becomes hallucinatory because of other reasons. Uh, and, and, you know, you're seeing that 837 over and over again, what is the significance to you? Because your story's wonderful, not that they pass, but you're going to go visit your family after not seeing them. You probably will impart the story. And whatever its significance may be, there's got to be some sense of solace that's then related to that. That in itself is something beautiful that, you know, maybe some people don't have in those experiences so it's an important thing i think to share and and to and to talk about and also too i think that there there is a great possibility that through that high you know sense of excited awareness where you know that classic helicopter crash where the hawaiian pilot tiny lifts the helicopter up like it's a, a feat of human strength this has happened before where people don't understand how they can actually do this a woman can lift a car so that they can pull their child out from underneath the tire or something like it's happened well and it was interesting I think for that me. even even us whether or not we know it are are looking for those things when they happen because in some ways we know they're bound to occur right um and it becomes that loop and then they take on if they take on the physical that's where then it starts to become in some senses pragmatic to go what pragmatic to go what happened here um and, and to question it because that's where the the, the the physical infiltrates and you go it's not just you know something else it's it, it, it or it's a fluke or i saw that number over and over again haphazardly because i don't realize it realize it psychologically that i have a propensity to look at the clock between this time and this time there's all those things that you know a healthy se- sense of skepticism is, is good to have when you're going into it but your story and how you feel about it 
is the amazing thing. Well, you know what's weird is is when you add up all the numbers, it equals eighteen. It was also the same day that she was laid to rest. Well, and you know what? I know and it's I did weird, that but... already, and it all in a numerological, <laughs> numerological number. It's also a nine because when you put the eight and the one together, and the nine is the representative number of that. So I don't know if nine has a significance to you in that regard. Well, what's weird is is that uh, um, I was just I just received a uh, predator's jersey um, as a gift for Christmas, and it just so happened to be the number nine. <laughs> of course, was it of course her? it did. <laughs> it did. I, you saw the picture. So was it from her? Uh, when, no, no, it was just a, it was a gift I was given for Christmas and it was okay. a Predators jersey and it just so happened. I've always wanted a Forsberg jersey and he wears number nine. So I received that a couple of days ago and here I am fixing to leave to go down there. So, I mean, I know it's kind of interesting. <laughs> but <laughs> We can do this all day. I know. I, know. You, I, I, feel, I day. feel like this is the uh, the movie with uh, Jim Carrey. What is it? Numbers? I, I know. I, I think I, it's like, what it is or something I, like that. I want and, so badly because because I know I, I've heard a lot of people doing this where they'll take these numbers and all these numbers will have significance and all these details right. and they'll connect them together you know I've, I've got a buddy of mine that does this that he connects all these weird things together that have absolutely nothing to do with each other and it's like <laughs> how are you like that makes no logical sense but in his, in his mind it does right but I want I want so badly to create a video where I go and just fake it and I go, OK, well, I'm going to go ahead and just pick a topic and I'm going to figure out every little detail in my life that can somehow tie to that. And I'm going to make it seem like it's some kind of conspiracy. And that's the video I'm going to record. And then people are going to watch that and they're going to go, oh, my God, that happened to me, too. Right, right, <laughs> like, right. Like it's, or you could pick a date in history that's really significant, like. 1773 or something yeah, like that. Yeah, and then Put you it take together the, and then look at the coincidental factors related to the numbers around that. Right, right, but for right. him to come up with the number nine yeah. and him not knowing that I just got that jersey that Forsberg wears that is the number he, nine. He had a one that in That was a little creepy. <laughs> I start while you were talking, I'm writing it down and doing the math. Right he had here, a one in ten chance of getting that. For you, right? <laughs> right, but that's what I'm saying. There's only it's 10 like digits. what are the what, there's only ten digits. But, but the fact that one through nine. I, I no, I understand that, but the fact that I was given a jersey, it could have been any number, you know, off of a off the team or a player. I'm just saying, I just thought that was kind of interesting. Um <laughs> it is interesting, but I'm not buying it that means anything. But don't you think that that's just a little coincidental? Yeah. That he comes up with the number coincidental, nine. Coincidental, yeah. He knows nothing about me. He knows nothing about the jersey. He knows nothing about the number. And then he comes up with the number nine. And I'm thinking back, well, just a few days ago, Saturday night, as a matter of, or Saturday, as a matter of fact, we go to the Preds game. And it just so happens to be the the one jersey I've been wanting for the last several years so happens to be Forsberg to wear number what, nine. What correlation would you have made had he said the number six? Probably nothing. <laughs> I bet you probably could think no, of something. <laughs> no, I could. I have a Shea Weber jersey. His number is six. I'm, I'm just saying. Any number. <laughs> I could pull a random number and you'll come up with something that it ties to it. Like, But the fact that both y'all came up with two different numbers and they both <laughs> happens to be Predator jerseys that I own, that's uh, kind of creepy. That was, I, well, I literally picked Y'all are making me a believer <laughs> as we speak. And, and, if you, and if you take a first year psych course, you can do a 20 question evaluation of people by asking them the basics of certain arbitrary things about their habits this is a this is what i love about social media platforms like guess what favorite you know star wars character i am or guess who i am on the brady bunch we've well, just pretty much sublimated a ton of stuff for marketing purposes yeah oh as yeah a result of answering your questions oh, yeah. right well i just thought so, this was interesting yeah. for oh, the it number was. correlations it definitely and, was it definitely no, no, no. Was. and i find so. it even more interesting that in the irony of it that here it is that i've done it ahead of time you're talking about it and just it feeds the conversation in that interesting, facilitative way. Right? But to take it a step further, to have this conversation, knowing I haven't been back down there, before, you know, since 2001 is also interesting, too. You know, so to know that we're having this discussion about... And if you add up all the numbers in 2001, you get three. What's that mean? Or if you take 20... <laughs> three and 20 and, and you take 20 and a one, you get two and a one, and you put the two and the one, you get three again. <laughs> But that three is an eight thirty seven. See eight thirty seven. That see, it's another connection. It clearly means something. I'm just saying. It's man. amazing how many things connect when you only have ten <laughs> points to work with. But you know what though? It, it's uh, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? But 
it, to me, it, it is interesting. If you really want to think outside the box is what we do on this show, right. I'm really kind of thinking outside of that box. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I'm taking this a step further. And when you start to... I'm, I'm open up my mind to this. I, I, I'm, you know, I don't think there's nothing wrong with that. No, no, nothing. No, so no, no, I, not at all. I just thought been, it was I've been down this road. I've been down this road, man. I used to do paganism for a while. I, I, I went from being a Christian to like not believing that. And I kind of went into paganism for about three months. <laughs> it, was, it was a while. And then I, and then I found and then as I'm studying, I'm, I realized, wait a minute, you guys have two gods. I don't even believe in the one God. Why am I going to believe in two gods? And then I became an atheist. It was, <laughs> You know, and it's interesting too, is it's because I'm driving down to see everybody. So if I happen to get in at eight thirty seven at night, I'll let you know. Oh yeah, that'll blow yeah, yeah, that'll yeah, blow yeah. my mind. Yeah, you better email me too. I know, yeah, I'll definitely let you know. I would let that I'll be known you know. if that ends up happening. I expected so. to come in at eight thirty seven, by the way. Yeah, well on, on I can make it happen. Via via mail <laughs> on an eight thirty seven jet. Yeah, I don't think that's a thing, but we're going to create one. <laughs> so, well, and you know what? Here's the thing, too. Um, when we were talking about that, too, and the whole um, – and I'm not trying to, to, to jump in there, but it, it conjures this other memory of something where my uncle had passed. And, you know, I had to be a pallbearer. Oh, crap. Was, I just noticed. Was, I don't mean to interrupt everybody, but yeah, look at yeah. the date, the same day that she was laid to rest. Do, do, do. Really? I just I happened to look it over to see what time it was, and I just looked down and it said twelve eighteen. Twelve eighteen. She was buried. That's the day. Yeah. Whoa. So, anyways, I just thought that was kind of a coincidental that we're also no, having no, no, yeah, the man, show the thing about coincidence on the same day. See them inside of that, right? You know, back um, in two thousand one. When my uncle had passed, though, uh, it was this is where I say, is it part of our own manifestation through need? through the trauma or heightened sense of awareness that these things are capable of occurring. So I'm a pallbearer, snowstorm, putting the man in the ground, crazy day, you know, just at your limit as far as emotion because I was very close to him. Right. That night I had to play a gig in the city and act like there's nothing wrong. Mm. Yeah. That's always when fun. I get home, before I change to drive back to the city, in my room... As I open the door and turn the light on, five feet in front of me is a fly fishing fly that he tied for me that I keep in my fly vest, in my box, in my garage, down the stairs, nowhere near that room. So I, 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 so I just I, – I, I do this. Do, do I, did I somehow move that? Is it a PK manifestation of something that I am capable of having this kinetic moment for my own solace? Or is it something that he purposely did? Is it something that's otherworldly or spiritual to create, again, that sense of peace and solace and satisfaction so in I have, myself that I need? Well, I, w I just want to know, when you share these stories, what kind of reaction do you typically get from these? Do you get a, a lot of people say, for instance, that that can relate to, to you know, some of the stories that you've told, or do you get a lot of people looking at you like, well, you're just you're, you're crazy, you know? Because I've often thought about when I shared my story, you know, I I would probably get some kind of look. So I was just kind of wondering what what has been the mix, or if there has been when you you know when you share these kind of stories with people. Like, how do they approach you or how do they look at it? Are they intrigued? Or are they kind of standoffish? What do you, what's been the reaction for you? That's a great question. Um, you know, it's funny. I don't talk about it a lot. Really? Okay. I, it's not something that I am toting or writing a book about or anything. I've been interviewed for people's books. I've been on a lot of great shows like your guys show to be able to talk about it. Did you hear that? We can wrap up the show and, now. He and, just said we have a great you, show. Yeah, man. And, <laughs> game game and, over. That's um, it. <laughs> I think that I think what it what it's done is it's that it's it's opened up a really healthy dialogue to the possibility of, and then uh, here's here's a great dialectic. A guy I work with have since I was sixteen. That's my producer and engineer. Who we cut all our music together here in my studio. He refuses to discuss this. Any of it. Hmm. Well, Not that's what I'm saying. I, it, I just kind of wonder heresy, what the feedback but I, I, has been. What it does to him actually is it scares the hell out of him. And that's kind of that's kind of what I was looking for was to to know the kind of responses that you get from certain individuals. 
and kind of how they they kind of take your stories that you tell them or how they respond to it. You know, for me, I think it's really interesting. Um, but then you might have folks that might look at you and just kind of like, well, this dude's off his rocker. But you don't really understand what people have gone through either. So it's really kind of hard to be, you know, one way about it, I guess, versus the other. So I, I don't know. I guess for me anyways, when I listen to what you're having to say, I'm really intrigued by the stories. But I just didn't know what if you kind of get some like pushback on other people that just telling you that you're crazy or you're making this up or have you kind of run into that before or now? Well, the only time I have is on what was one show where I know, like I said, off air, we were talking and it was just some sort of weird setup. And okay. I felt like I was also being attacked because of my stance that I have on politics right. and public service. And it was it, so for me, no, because it's usually come up at a little party somewhere or, mm-hmm. you know, people telling a story. Right. That I'm already listening to where I go, well, hey, you know what? I don't think what you're talking about is so crazy because I've had something similar happen to me and I, I still am having trouble coping with it. Yeah, that, that was uh, kind of that was kind of what I was looking for is mm-hmm. to is to see if there's been a difference, you know, or, you know, if it's kind of even tilt where you get a lot of people that are interested and then they share similar experiences or if you had a lot of people that look at you that okay well this is kind of outlandish to think about or even to believe so i was just kind of curious about that you know so that's that's, i think that's an amazing question and most of the time that's not usually part of a dialogue and Mm -hmm. and a lot of people i think are also are incapable through fear because of what they are still questioning themselves are not capable of you know articulating and for fear of reprisal right as as a result of those kinds of things but like your 837 brother i'm not here to judge you based on it i know that the experience has touched you somehow in, in whatever way significant it might be that's why i say that's more of the beautiful factor behind it so uh, criticism is one thing, <laughs> you know, healthy conjecture is another thing. Um, and, and, and that's why I still approach many of these things with just about the same amount of skepticism as most people should. Right. Rather than rather than trying to straight up bully somebody or just totally yeah. dismiss them or, altogether. Or, or just jump into those crazy stories where you just know, like, I mean, some of this stuff I've heard, like I said before, are just the, the, I don't believe them. I'm sorry. And it has nothing to do with the story or, or them as a person it has more to do with the story. And, and maybe, and it's not even the way they've described it. There's just circumstantially, factually, you relate it, you check it out, you look and you go, no, I don't, I don't Yeah, that, that's, it. that's what I was, that's what I was interested in. Cause I, I didn't, I still, I mean, I don't believe your, your stories either necessarily, but at the very beginning I was, you know, remember I was asking you more like what, what's been the impact on your life? What, what does that mean to you? I, I think I find that way more fascinating than the actual details of what happened because when you get right down to it, there's no possible way to prove it one way or another. And that's, you know, that's just a, that's just a rabbit hole. You're just going to waste your time on. But what you can talk about is that very real feeling of how those events impacted you, whether they're real or not, you know? Well, and you know what? That's so beautiful that you said that man, because I respect so much of what you said. Um, and, and I'm glad that you don't believe my stories to tell you the truth. That's I think healthy. And, but they have the same attachment for me as natural experiences that I've had just by being outside in the bush with animals, just being in nature and being privy to experiences that most people have never seen things. Like, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, a queen being followed by hundreds of bees to create a new hive. That feeling is almost otherworldly in that regard and almost has that same sense of presence for me like if i hadn't been here at this moment in time to witness this event this impact of this moment wouldn't have affected me so greatly right and that's why it is interesting because it fuels my artistic sort of side and how i write and what i think about yeah you definitely need you definitely need some some uh fuel to, to, to keep those creative energies going i i'm right there with you man and i, I wouldn't say that I, I i do or that i don't believe his stories i think for me what it does is it allows me to listen mm-hmm. process and come to my own conclusions right and i think that's where a lot of people today in society don't do that 
they're quick to judge, they're quick to be judgmental of things that you say and things that you do, that they don't allow themselves to take the time to hear what you have to say, process it, then come to your own conclusions. You know, and, and that's one of the reasons why we do this show is to talk to people and to be able to hear what they have to say. And hopefully that when people watch the videos are able to have that same kind of thought process to be able to sit back and just listen and then come to their own conclusions. So, you know, like I said, I can't I think the stories are, are great. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, I'm very interested, you know. Oh, they're great stories. Absolutely. Right. So I, especially, I, I'm just... especially when you stop talking and nobody talks. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. like that's how you know you've hit a good a good story. Right. So for me, it, it's one of those um, situations where I, I enjoy listening to what people have to say. And then once I've had some, you know, time to think about it, I'll process it and kind of, you know, like I said, draw my own conclusions. So, you know, for me, it's... I've always been kind of an individual that like the number situation, we talked about that, you know, and I'm not necessarily like attached to it and, and believing all of it and wondering if there's, you know, a significance and going out and checking every book that I can possible or, (laughs) you you know, and and then just have these numbers running through my brain 24 seven. I just think that when it's coincidental, like when I looked at the, you know, the date on the computer, I see it and I'm like, huh. That's interesting. But then five minutes later, I move on from it and I just talk it up as something that's coincidental. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense, but. But, bro, just... you're totally right, man, because that's. You, you're jumbling the stories yourself to discern your own ideas is what needs to happen more. It allows any of us to think outside of the box. Right. Nothing, nothing is really black and white, I, I don't think. No. Um, I, and I think until you so, personally go through something say that what you've gone through nobody's going to fully understand nobody's going to understand the stories nobody uh, the best we can do is listen and like i said you know come up with our own conclusions at the end of the conversation or even ask more questions and and just to kind of get more insight on that and it was you know kind of the purpose of the show but i did want to ask you about the was it a Sasquatch sighting? Oh yeah, yeah. There was a mention in that in that brief story about about a Sasquatch sighting. I was curious about that. I was very curious. Uh, about actually, that. I was I was really more curious about the word cryptozoological Sasquatch. Okay, well, yeah, that, that too. That that was what made it like. Wait, I've heard of Sasquatch. What is a cryptozoological Sasquatch? I think well, of currency cri- given to the the Sasquatch. No, not, not cryptocurrency. <laughs> <laughs> it's a blockchain based Sasquatch. <laughs> this out this dude is out for money, man. It's marketing stunts is what it is. <laughs> oh, that is awesome. But no I, meaning hidden zoological, so right. yeah, I'm just trying to be fancy with words. I'm a writer. Yeah, I, know, okay, I, I, I did notice I did notice that. Um, All right, so uh, disregard you know, cryptozoological. I, yeah, the story I'm still again, something I'm having trouble processing and still asking people questions about um yeah 2015 in july was the sixth hot summer i was going to the garden i grow a very big garden here got a couple acres worth of food nice Um, nice we have a pasture of 50 acres that bleeds down to a bush and my dog God love him, but he gets into a lot of trouble. Porcupines, skunks, you name it. And uh, we have a, a ravenous and or very active group of coyotes that has chased him previously out of the back 40 right up to the house, to the front door practically. Uh, so I'm very wary of that. And at 6.30 in the afternoon, I'm walking out to the garden to do some chores. And I hear the coyotes going ballistic, like they're ripping something apart. Classic, like in the middle of the night, like you normally would raccoon fight they're doing something with a deer you know um i put him back in the house and the way our field comes up on a slant before it bleeds down to that 50 acres it's a rise so as you're walking up the rise you don't have view of the full pasture until you kind of come up to the peak Mm -hmm. so as i'm walking up to find out why all these coyotes are going crazy i the first thing in my mind is this i see and this is what i say why is there somebody wearing a jumpsuit and a balaclava on a, you know, hot, hot J- July day standing at the bottom of the field? And 
the where the coyotes are, I can't see them because they're at the breast of the tree line and they refuse to come out. They're obviously agitated by whatever this person or figure is. And there's got to be, you know, a multiple coyotes that are there, at least six to 12. I can't see them, though, but I see this figure. Uh, it's standing sideways from my perspective. As I'm looking at it and I'm kind of coming up the hill, I see it like sit down, like behind a bramble with large uh, dogwood that are there, uh, raspberries that are growing at that time of the year, a lot of big field grass at the bottom end. So I lose sight of it. And I think this person is either seeing me and they're on my property and they're trying to hide from me. So Within what would what would thought, make you what would make you think that it's a Sasquatch? I mean, it just well here's of, here's okay here's where it gets strange is that after just having that thought, this person comes running like a quadruped, so two feet back like a dog would run or a jackrabbit, and it covers a, a large portion, almost a third of that back fifty in like five bounds while it's doing this. Hmm. And I got so scared that I went into a genuflecting position on my right knee and I started to turn because I was like, is this a bear? Is this a black bear? Because we have black bear around here. Right. It, it's As I'm doing this, it stopped and it stood up on two feet. It turned to its left and it walked like on an angle across that field to the south back into that pasture to another bush line in a sauntering fashion, like just sort of taking its time. And I watched it the whole time. How long did this go on for? About five minutes. About five minutes? Okay. So but I was, I was at the point where when I had turned and, and, it's, and I was looking at, and I thought I was, I'm upwind of it. Because we have a westerly wind and it's east of me. Have I agitated a black bear, right? Um, but they're usually not that aggressive unless they're, you know, mating or they're in heat or they've got cubs with them, which there was no sign of any of that. Hmm. Um, and I, uh, as I, as it left and I'm sort of in that position, still in that sort of fight or flight moment, still watching and looking and do I leave, you know? Uh, that still trying to process what it is that I just saw. Again, I have no photographic evidence. I have no video evidence. All I have is the fear inside of me that <laughs> I've been spending a lot of time in the bush in my life. And I have, and I continue to, will continue to do so. But I've never seen anything like this. And it terrified me so much that it took me a whole year before I could go back there again by myself. You know, it kind of reminds me of the story that you started off the show with talking about uh, the 11 year old and how, you know, your grandmother, I think it was your grandmother was talking about the story that you guys would tell every Christmas. So now this kind of seems like this is your story to tell every Christmas about your encounter with this. That's at least that's kind of what I've kind of drawn to with, you know, with this as well. <laughs> well you I know, mean, if you think about it, you know, my ne my nephew's got like, you know, he's very interested in this stuff. He's in the armed forces and we, he's always asking me questions about this kind of stuff. And we love to talk about this. But again, I, I as, as, as much as I wanted to try to understand what I thought it was, mm -hmm. I still spent a lot of time asking a good friend of mine who's a hunter. He's been hunting for 40 years. Is this normal behavior for a black bear? Have you ever seen a black bear do this and be able to walk very, you know, on two legs, but then go to four legs? Yes, obviously this can happen, but this, it seems so human-like. And, and, and at the same time, very hard to discern in terms of, I couldn't see a face. Uh, I couldn't see... Uh, anything that I could say was like, well, this was a chest muscle. I couldn't see what I, because I was still so afraid trying to observe what this was. And at, again, s astonished by its speed and how it was running is what alarmed me. Now, it made at, me at think some point, I'm, did, I'm being attacked. Now, right? at some point, did you go back once you kind of calmed down to see if you could find any footprints or any kind of evidence that would suggest that something was out there or. 
was it? No, I mean, it, took, it literally took me a year to gather the courage to be able to go back there because I was so afraid. The only thing I did in that year was um, my wife and I did a little thing where I did a video thing just to sort of describe the story. Mm-hmm. And I and I went to the top of the field line. But I did a lot of research uh, from a, a, a number of different sites, whether it be Bigfoot or Sasquatch or anything related to strange coincidences that seemed to be similar to what I had seen. The thing that struck me most was that there was a report that happened just years before that. And the people themselves, four of them, witnesses, described something that I remember that scared me, which was the jackrabbit sized running man thing running by their car in an incident where they thought this thing was a deer approaching an an open road and they're coming up. So they slow down. And what they see is this jackrabbit sized running man in this field. That was my next question is if, if anybody else have had encounters in your area of something similar that you're describing and if so how long ago or has there has there been anything you know relevant since or since the 20s the since the 20s nsa investigator anthony some since the the cia of uh, of me coming out is what it is (laughs) i'm telling you (laughs) <laughs> no, I, I just wanted to know that if there was any anything, you know, been you know, anything else has been reported um since your episode or or situation of your encounter since then, or has has there been anything in, in prior years of this? Um, well since since the late twenties, this area from all the way up in Tobamori, which is up in Lake Huron, which is the top end of the Bruce Trail, uh all the way down into the Niagara Scarpment, apparently is this sort of conduit or area uh, that seems to have an alarming amount of these kinds of sightings that have been going on and reported, but still have that strange connection to circumstance. Like they saw something, it was big, it looked like this, it was doing this. Um, So, I, I mean, there could be so many things that anybody could speculate on what or if it is anything at all. Right. I just know for me, my my experience scared me enough to the point that I couldn't explain it uh, because I've had a black bear experience. I've had one right outside my tent because my wife left left her chapstick or organic chapstick in the tent, you know, and I'm chasing it at two in the morning with my grandfather's bayonet and a frying pan and a canoe whistle trying to chase it away. You can aggress black bear. They will not, you know, but this I, I still... I'm having processing problems with it. Please, and it, please it, it, tell it me. Wasn't, it, it wasn't uh, coincidentally, even at a time where we were speaking before about this heightened sense of awareness moment. Right. It, it, it seemed to be so arbitrary now looking back in retrospect about why, when, or any of those things. So please tell me you've got some trail cams out there or something now. I've got two, actually. <laughs> and, and no luck so far. You know, know what we ought to do for the uh you know what we ought to do for the for the page on on uh YouTube mm-hmm. is get a link to the his webcams and then have a live running <laughs> feed live feed live feed 24 hours and well, people they're, just they're, go they're, in they're, and watch they're, it they're, and they're they're chips so if anything comes up on that chip you guys will be the first to get it <laughs> right on right on well, I would we, be one of those people that would just sit there and have my phone out and just Watch nothing for hours and hours <laughs> in hopes of uh, of something would show up. And in that brief moment that a deer crosses its path and the sensors go off, I'm like, <laughs> your heart is going a thousand like, miles an hour. There it is. You know, you know what's interesting Fuck, about this it. too is that it, it, the connection points again to whatever it means in our lives. Right. Like, you know, I've I've spoken to some people in the Cree community, Ojibwe community, Skugog community all indigenous tribes of the area, you know, and whether or not they have their own stories about who these are beings are or what they represent to them, all kind of sort of parallels my feelings about my own experiences. Like your question before about how does this feel your life? Mm. You know, how does it, how does it change your perspective on, on thinking about things? I think that that's one of the most potent things that any of those groups of people said to me was, the experience has done something to you that has, you know, not changed me, but has has opened a different side of, of, of me that that is just, uh, you know, another part of my story 
experience, my, my, my feelings behind experiencing something and then trying to articulate it. No different than how I feel about my own human condition or whatever is going on. So, Absolutely. you know, that, that was one of the most potent things said to me after that experience is just by reaching out to different people, trying to tell the story without fear of ridicule, really. <laughs> Well, we're glad you, you were able to come on and talk to us and share those stories and, you know, and have that opportunity to do it. I've always been intrigued by this sort of um, conversation to be had. You know, I like to explore things that I'm not necessarily aware of. And and um, it, it's interesting because I like to to um, broaden my horizons on on things and experiences that people have gone through and, and, and personal experiences myself as well. So, but I think we wanted to share some of your music and, and give you sure. know, folks an opportunity but I, I have to, to say to you both, um, Anthony and Tony, yeah. um, or, uh, uh, um, I, I, uh, Daniel, it was Daniel. Just, just, yeah, Daniel. it was just nice being able to speak with you and, um, have a critical, healthy conversation. Absolutely. You know, it, it wasn't anything strange or out of the ordinary. So yeah. I, I appreciate you guys and, and oh, yeah. the show and being on the show and, and to be able to talk about that. Well, you want to tell folks where they can reach you if they're interested in hearing more from you or, or your music? Absolutely. EdRoman.net and uh, check out all my social media pages through there. You usually find every connection to Special Ed Roman. That's Twitter, Instagram, YouTube channels. I'm working on a video and it's already been completed a full year of PR through film festivals with Nelson Diaz, famed animator from New York City. We are about to embark on a fundraising campaign for tutoring programs for kids that struggle with dyslexia, which nice. is actually a, a gift. So if you're seeing that in the ether and you, and you might want to read about the story and participate, it's, it's a really good thing. I like that a lot. So we're gonna pull up this video and we'll, we'll give people a. F we're gonna we're gonna wrap with playing your video and 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 you can hang up now if you'd like to and and. Uh, <laughs> hey, but you guys stay in touch, man. I really enjoy speaking with you both. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely, no doubt. <laughs> nice, nice to meet you, man. I'm you too. Okay. I'm a radical. I am love. Like any other human being. No longer in search of meaning I'll utilize my soul To be a messenger To be a radical To be love Be a messenger Be a radical Post.